Have a seat. How's everybody doing? Is this working? <coughs> welcome. Thank you. I feel so welcome. Yeah, yeah. Does, it, do I, does this make you feel odd that I'm wearing a beanie? I'm freezing. <laughs> I'm totally bald. So I'm always cold. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you, if you didn't notice, I don't know if you noticed, but the hair thing. You've made a deal with it now, so yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, done yeah, yeah, so, yeah, it's too late. I wasn't going to talk about your Everyone's baldness at all. At me. Yeah. Um, I thought we were going to maybe. I was. I did bring some uh, kind of some shaving cream and things. I thought maybe we were gonna <laughs> gonna kind of uh, put you into the club, but your wife's here, and I don't yeah. think she'll yeah, really appreciate that. So yeah. that, let's not do that. Okay. Um, so you flew in this morning. Yes. Uh, we, we've had we've had some time to hang out today, uh, which has been nice. But the last time that I saw you, uh, we were in California, and so in, in February, all of the grind directors from around the world come together, and we, we kind of get to know each other, and we we learn and we share, and it's all wonderful. But then Derek forced us all to do karaoke. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the last the abiding memories I have of that is, is is Derek with a microphone in his hand, funnily enough, um, doing some doing some pretty cool things, but. The question was, I'm, I'm always really curious about CEOs of large companies, and, and you know, by extension, you are a CEO of a pretty large company with you know everyone that reports in. Um, when you get into social situations with people like that, do you really relax and have fun? Are you watching people kind of going, what can I learn from how well this person interacts and or sings? You like, what, am I watching the people on our team oh, and yeah. thinking like, can yeah. this person be a leader if they Absolutely. can what, hold the right note? Because you know, No, I wasn't thinking that at all. <laughs> I, you should probably be the CEO because I was just like, I hope no one gets hurt and uh, hopefully you know, everyone gets back on the bus at the end of the night. Those were the things I was focused on. Yeah. Because I think a lot of CEOs do that. You know, they, they, they engineer these sort of social occasions and they bring their teams out and they, they watch them. Play right, and I think you see a lot from people by how they play. You weren't you weren't doing that. We're I was, really not I was anywhere near that thoughtful, unfortunately. Uh, I was like thinking more sneaky, songs, you know. Yeah, you were to see. Yeah. Trying to think, think ahead. Of <laughs> really like, really powerful kind of show your leadership skills some yeah. kind of song. What is that? That's not that one. I think I heard you singing that work, 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 work. Was it that one? You really nailed it. Yeah. The, the Rihanna one? Yeah. Yeah, that's me. He wasn't dancing with anyone, I promise. It was just him and Francisco. <laughs> um, you, 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 you pretty mean rapper, though, I have to say. That was, that was pretty impressive. Would you describe that as your mildly interesting superpower? Um, yes. Huh? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, um, Let's uh, move swiftly on and... Uh, this, this I love that idea, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about something other than karaoke. Um, so, maybe just set a little bit of context. <clears throat> talk a little bit about Startup Grind as is today, just to kind of get a sense of how big the organization is, what kind of impact it's currently having. Yeah, so uh, Startup Grind, uh, our mission is to educate every entrepreneur in the world. Uh, we do that uh, through local chapters just like this. We have more than 200 of those in 80 countries and they're run by uh, a thousand uh, essentially volunteers and chapter directors, uh, much like uh, David here. Um, and uh, we've been hosting events since 2010 when we started in my office. Uh, last year we hosted 1,200 events, so about 100 a month, uh, for about 75,000 people. Um, but when we do events, we do it like this, in about 100 you know, or so uh, per event. And, um, and so what we feel that that does and why, why the world needs that is because we're able to build these local communities in cities around the world um, and to bring, uh, normally you won't get it tonight, but usually we bring really high quality education and, and um, great experiences uh, that you can learn from, from top entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and thought leaders. Um, and so this, this came out of a problem that uh, me and my friends had and, uh, and it turned out other people had the same problem. And so, here we are. I mean, I mean like you launched the, 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 the grind, it probably wasn't even called the grind at the time. And I, I meant to say that, I mean, the, 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 the purpose of the grind is celebrating the grind of being an entrepreneur, right? Because there is so much out there that says, you know, startups is a path to success, glorious success, and every step along the way is going to be a perfect step. And I think that you've, you've, you've proven that through your own career that it's, it's not that case, right? Yeah, technically the only person that calls it the grind is you. Oh, right, okay. Um, but I love when you say it because you have, you know, one of these sophisticated 
Irish voices, and it just sounds so like awesome when we you should, say it. We should just the grind. grind. <laughs> say it again. How do you say it? When you say it, it really makes it sound sick, like sick, like American sick. So you just just answer the question. Well, I don't know what the question was. I just keep hearing it in my head. The grind. <laughs> you know, so what was the question? I don't know. Yeah, I've, 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 I've forgotten that. Um, but when, when you launched it, when yeah. you started doing yeah. it, that's a busy space, right? So there was tons of other meetups well, we weren't, and we weren't trying to do, we weren't, okay, so we, I would go to events and I'd sit next to some, some guy and, um, and, and, he, and I'd say like, hey, what are you working on? And he'd just pitch my brains out. And it's like the worst, I hate getting like my brains pitched out. It's like one of the worst experiences. I, I, I liken it to like having to watch someone kiss a mirror or something. It's just awful. Like I, I hate, I just, it, it's such a one way experience, right? And then I'd say, and then he'd say, well, what are you working on? And I'd say, well, I just left electronic arts. You know, I, I worked on some cool stuff there and I'm just getting started. And he'd be like, oh, okay. And then he just turned and faced back to the front. And it was like, I had something to give. I had something to share. I, had, I could help him or her. And, um, and so I just felt like the events that I went to, they didn't share the values that I had. And it, it wasn't collaborative. And it wasn't this kind of this idea that everybody brings something to the table. And so, um, <laughs> So we just decided to kind of do it ourselves. And it, there was no intention for it to ever be anything. No one's more surprised by the success of Start Run than me. Um, and, and it's just because it was just something we were doing for fun. And what I've learned though is m most of the great startups, they all happen that way. They start as a project where there's low pressure for it to become anything. And we had two years to incubate it. That's, you, you wanna keep your startup a project as long as you can. Because as soon as you call it a startup, then like the pressure's on. And, and pressure can be really good, but at the very earliest stages, you just need time. Time is either your friend or your enemy. And so we had two years. And much to my surprise, it, it grew and grew and grew over that, over that period. I've had lots of other things that I've spent two years on that, and I spent all my time on it, didn't grow at all. But we just, there was very low pressure, it was very organic. And then at some point, you know, we switched over and said, okay, let's actually really work hard on this versus one day a month. And, and, it, and it kind of immediately took off. But it had all the indicators of that before of, of like, wow, this is just, it has a life of its own. It's like pushing a ball downhill versus, or a rock downhill versus pushing rock uphill. And you, you, some of you are probably pushing a rock, a very big rock uphill right now. And I have done that more than a dozen times and it is really, really hard. And, and sometimes you just have to push it up to the top of the hill and then it will start to get momentum because it has no, there's no inertia, there's no energy whatsoever. So you gotta just get something. Um, but, uh, but the great idea is they just, they go on their own. And, and, uh, and the products don't have to be perfect and, you know, and the team doesn't have to be perfect, but it's a great market, it, there's a huge need and the customers will pay for it, and the customers won't freak out that you don't have every perfect little thing because the pain is so great. Those, those are the startups that we read about um, in magazines and they get funded. It's the ones that solve great customer pain um, and, and are attacking really big markets. So that, that was a much longer answer than I was expecting. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pull you back. There was, was, was a bit of a rant about, about, about startups, but that's cool. Um, so, just to go way, way back, when, when, when you started going to those events that the people there were not behaving the way you expected and you wanted, do you think, did you start the grind as a result of going to those events and, 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 and discovering for yourself, this isn't what I want? Or did you go into those events thinking, I just want to go and help people? And, and that was your mindset going in, or was it you know, a discovery thing as you were going to the various events? I think I just went to go and learn and yeah, of course, to help people along the way. Okay, because lots of people go to events wanting to help people, but you know, how many people decide, I'm gonna start building a community myself. Mm. So at what stage did it become, I wanna just go and do this, build this thing for myself? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know that I looked at it quite like that. I think in the beginning it was just like, let's just solve this problem for me to educate myself and, ed and my friends 
you know, the, the guy that started with me, to educate, for us to educate ourselves. And then um, the community kind of rallied around that, which was just five of my friends and five of his friends, and then, and then eventually people that we didn't know. Um, but there really was no community. It, like, and again, in the beginning, like, there's nothing. So uh, there was no reason to call it a community. It was just like a bunch of dudes eating crappy pizza. <laughs> You know, and occasionally, hopefully, women were attending as well. I don't, I don't mean to exclude women, um, but like, you know. And then over time, it was like, hey, there's like the same people are coming back again and again, and wow, they like they really got were getting something out of this event that they weren't getting somewhere else. And like they were help they were doing business together, they were helping each other, and that's when, like, the community thing just happened organically. It wasn't like I set out one day like, I'm going to build a community, you know? And it was just like, we're just gonna like throw it on the wall and see if it sticks. And, and it turned out that it did stick. Do, do you think that, that that approach is the only way to build a, a community that is strong and, and, and sort of true to its, 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 its values to sort of just keep on listening to people? Do you think you can set out, you know, with sort of specific obstacles and goals in mind and just, you know, build it? Or does it have to be continuous discovery? I, I think you can have a goal to say, like, I want to build a community as part of this product. And you can do different things, like you can create a really good ecosystem for engineers to to develop on your API or something. And you can you can create really great, you know, message boards and forums. And But, like, I, there is an organic nature to it that just happens. And I, I would say, like, Lyft, which is not really here, but, like, Lyft, attracted these certain types of people that were different from Uber drivers. And there was this community of like, it just felt more like, it was more informal, and they had like these mustaches, that probably helped like, they were kind of weird. But like, um, that just kind of like, reinforced this kind of like, casual culture, and the casual driver versus the Uber drivers being like, you know, like black car guys, and, and, and black car drivers who like, just became Uber drivers. So like the the decisions you make about the product can reinforce the community, but um, but much of those things just kind of needs to take a life of its own. And the example I would use is that sitting in one of the events, an entrepreneur entrepreneur approached me and said, "We should do this in L.A. I love the brand, I love the values, I love the format. Like we just need to do this. We don't have this." And I, and my response to him was, "This is a horrible idea. Like no, we're not doing that." And um, but the community wanted it, and so, like, we we said, okay, we facilitated it. But really, it just kind of happened almost spontaneous, spontaneously. I, I remember when, <coughs> one of the first times we met. I hadn't yet joined the grind, and, and you were talking to. Uh, uh, I said it again, the grind. I do say it. Um, yeah, it sounds great. No, okay, I think people um, <laughs> put a little more you know, lungs into grind. it if you can. Is that better? Just in. <laughs> um, I remember you were talking to a bunch of new recruits, you, you, you were meeting a bunch of directors for the first time, and you said to them that it was the greatest return on time invested that they were ever going to you know, participate in for, 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 for themselves. So in, in the early months, when you were starting to build up that community and you know, organically growing it, were you also working on other projects as part of Vaporware? And, and how were you starting to measure your return at that stage? Yeah, so, and just uh, to clarify that, my, the name of yeah, the company before uh, the startup grind, it was grind. The, before the grind, was um, this company that we had called Vaporware Labs, uh, which for any, anyone that knows what Vaporware is, it just set the expectation really low. We always exceeded expectations when we ship products. Um, it was kind of a bad joke that just went on for too long. <laughs> We'd go into like a meeting at like a Palm or you know, Netgear or something, and they'd be like, and your company's called Vaporware Labs? And like, yeah, we're totally credible. We will ship the product for you. We will build it. And they're just like, anyways, some of you are looking at me like, I don't know what Vaporware means, but you can look it up. It means that you'll never ship a product. You'd never ship product. It's like a fake product. Um, so, uh, so anyways, so, well, well, I got off, I got off track on Vaporware. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so, oh, the return on the investment of directors? Yeah. But for yourself at that time, so so you were you were obviously doing other projects. Yeah, in the beginning, like what I would do is again, you kind of have to brute force a little bit of it. So like, I would like the first ten chapters was just dumb. Like whoever we could get to do it. If you had two legs and a brain, like we were begging you to do startup brain. 
okay? And so uh, the first guy from LA, I talked about him. Then we found this girl in New York. And then um, this guy attended one of my events and he had taken a taxi from Stanford, he's from Singapore, and he like needed to ride home and it was like a, probably like a $30 cab ride. And he, I was like, Where, how did you get here? He's like, I took a cab from Stanford. And I was like, wow, like you really wanted to come, huh? He's like, yeah, it seemed really good. I was like, you should do Star Brand Singapore. You seem great. <laughs> <laughs> like this is how my dumb American brain works. And so, so then like these two guys that at the next event came up to me and they're like, I'm not going to do my Australian accent, it's so bad. But I, they came up and was like, hey, we're from Sydney. And like we were, uh, one of them was like, I work at Vodafone. We just think this was really cool. And I'm like, wait, you guys are from Sydney? Like, yeah, we're just in town. I'm like, you should do, you guys should do startup grind. You're perfect. <laughs> like literally like 30 seconds in, right? And they're like, w well, we just were saying hi. We didn't really sign up for anything. <laughs> and we kind of wish we hadn't talked to you now. I'm like, okay, when are you leaving? Tomorrow at lunch. I'll take you to breakfast, seven in the morning tomorrow, meet me here. And so we met up and I just begged them, you know, it, you know, and tried to sound confident with begging, but I begged them to do Star Grand Sydney and they somehow said yes. And they did it and they did this great job. And then one of the guys ended up now, he, he moved and he, He's now at, uh, in New Haven, where, where Yale is, which is like, you know, one of the best schools in America. And so we just found this out. He became the Yale chapter director. He like had all these good things that happened to him in Sydney. He moved to Yale a year ago or something. He started hosting it there. He like had all these teachers, all these alumni from Yale. Then he got the dean of the business school. And then he like became friends with them from Startup Grind. And he just got himself into Yale. <laughs> like what a cool life hack, right? Um, but like that's like, okay, so we got really lucky with Adam. We got lucky with a lot of people, but they were like the core people in the beginning. You know, we, our guy in Toronto that I met, you know, and, and we weren't really sure if he was going to work or not, and we went with it. He, he, he just stepped down um, just recently because of some, some health issues with his family, but he, um, he literally hosted 50 events for us in Toronto four straight years every month, like crushed it. And um, those people, like, you know, those were our pioneers. Mm -hmm. And But, but I'm, I'm curious to understand at that stage, you know, how, how were you valuing your time and, and your return? Were you, were you working on other side projects? Because like, you know, you can, you can do a grind a month and it doesn't take up a full month of your time, right? So was there other stuff that you were doing that you were looking at <coughs> saying, I could be building a different product if working a different project, but grind is pulling me back and why? So a year and a half in, I'm hosting these events. This guy came to me from LA, so we did this event in LA. And I went to meet with my mentors, and I was talking to them about it, and I was like, I'm spending 29 days of the month working on this thing, and I'm pushing that ball up the hill as hard as I can for 29 days, and it's like not really moving. Okay, so we're, it's a social network thing. You know, we were pouring money into it. We weren't getting that many users, and we were iterating and trying, and then it was like, I'm sending one day a month or two days a month on Startup Grind, and it's like, seems to be going really well. And so my mentors, who had been working with me for several years, they said, hey, I'm looking from back here, non-objective uh, third party, and I think it's pretty obvious that this thing has a lot of momentum. Why don't you just spend like 10 days or 15 days on that and see what happens and then just dial down this thing that's not working? And so that's what I did. And then over the next six months, it went from like, you know, five to ten days to everything. And um, we sold the other product just to kind of get rid of it, and um, just focused totally on startup crime. But it was it was a it was two months, two years incubating, and then six months like weaning off the other things to get on startup crime, hundred percent. At, at what stage did you decide to? look at the model of having the big conference and, and, and starting to work with sponsors on a more sort of national level and, and, and move away from the, the monthly fireside chat model? Well, we've just, so we, we host uh, three conferences. We do one in Silicon Valley in February and we do, we're doing one in London next week and we're doing <laughs> one in LA in September. And um, really that just came the way all of these things have come with Startup Grind, which is we're just trying to solve the, a problem. And the problem we tried to solve was we wanted to get all the great directors were meeting across the world, the guy in Singapore, the guy in, in Toronto, the guy in Melbourne, the guy you know here in Dublin. We wanted them all to get in a room together so they could meet each other and just become friends because they were so cool, we're meeting them. 
So we're like, well, how do we get them to come to Silicon Valley? We don't have any money. So like, what if we threw like a really cool event? Maybe that would convince them to actually fly out and come. And we had like everyone like staying on air mattresses and like in our friends' apartments and stuff. And so, and to our surprise, people came and then the conference kind of just emerged out of that. And, and actually you were there, you were like the first sponsor of the thing. And you came and participated there at, at that, you know, um, that was the first time I met you in the spring of 2013. So that's three years after our first event. So it's taken us a long time to get there. Um, but, uh, but that really, that changed a lot of things. That showed the power of, it's not just you, like little thing in Singapore, little thing in Toronto. It's like this whole global network and we're all connected. And like the sum of our parts is actually really valuable. Did that, did that daunt you at any stage you know, that, that you were taking on this, this I mean, the mission is, is fairly ambitious, right? Connecting every single entrepreneur on the planet. And then suddenly, because like that first conference was a very professional conference. You have, you know, top line speakers coming along. Were, were you, did you have misgivings at that stage thinking, what am I taking on? This is a massive events management company. I, I don't feel a lot of pressure with Startup Grind, much less than I felt with other things, even though it's much bigger and there's much more pressure because it's still a project to me. Like we still have fun and like we just kind of see what happens, you know? And there's a lot more at stake, I guess, to lose, but it was never gonna be anything. So like I, everything's upside to me at this point. So, you know, I like, you know, if, if it all goes away tomorrow, like I still have all my friends that are chapters and we're still gonna be friends, I think. Um, unless <laughs> you don't, don't shave my head, right? Don't right. shave your head in the middle of the night next time you come to the valley. Um, uh, but, you know, like, so it, it, there's not, like, we don't have investors, we're bootstrapped, probably like a lot of you, that, that, that's a different kind of pressure. We, we push ourselves, we have advisors that push us, but I don't have investors, so I mean, you have to exit in seven years. You know, so that, and we could take investors, and we have been, people have asked us to, to take their money, and um, that's, we wanna build the company we wanna build. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we don't wanna be beholden to something like that, so, uh, so yeah, no, I don't. I, I work very. I don't work any harder on this than I worked on those other things that I worked on that didn't work at all. It's an interesting insight, right? Talk a little bit about those things that didn't work at all. I mean, like I, I know you kind of, you know, it's self-deprecating, and you say, you know, spectacular failures, occasional successes. Talk about some of those spectacular failures. We want to start. When I left EA, I start. I left to quit my job. I had a great job. I was offered a big promotion to stay and I left to start a truck advertising company, of all things. What a terrible idea. I mean, really, really bad. Uh, my friend, my best friend, it was a truck guy, and I was a marketing guy, and because we're so smart, we like put those two skill sets together, and what do you come up with? A bunch of truck ads, right? It's, it just makes, it's clear, it's just so simple. Um, and I spent three months, or six months, trying to sell it. I could not sell a single truck ad. Not one. And I'm not the best salesman in the world, but I'm certainly not the worst. And uh, this was a very bad data point. <laughs> um, so that was the first. And, and right as I was quitting my job, my friend, like his wife had triplets or something, so he couldn't quit. And so like, it was just me and I'm sitting there in like a windowless conference room that I had hijacked because you know, my friend was in real estate and he let me like sneak into this room. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, got all these things on the walls and I'm like, Truck ads, truck ads. I freaking hate truck ads. Like I hate trucks. I hate everything about trucks. It's like bad for the environment. Like everyone hates trucks. They cut you off, they're rude. Truckers are like, you know, kind of not always the most wonderful people in the world to deal with. Um, if there's a lot of truckers out there, you know, don't walk out. Oh, it's, we got four or five truckers. No, I'm just kidding, no one's one. Okay, and so like anyway, so that failed absolutely miserably. I didn't make one sale. So that was my first, like my own startup. Did you want to That's go? Number one. Did you, did you want to go running back to EA at that stage? Um, was, did you? Did you? Like, I was too embarrassed. <laughs> I was too embarrassed to go back. Did you? Did you learn anything from it? I mean, like that experience of starting something and failing. Did you, did you have some some similar experience at EA? I was trying to force something. It was a total force. Yeah. Like I need to do a startup. This is what I'm doing. So I did that. It was a terrible idea. It it wasn't a product any customers wanted. <laughs> It wasn't a good business. Like the margins are terrible on printing huge vinyl signs. It's terrible and you gotta rip them off and stuff, it's a mess. 
I mean, I wouldn't know because I didn't sell any, but like I talked, <laughs> I talked to people that had done it and it seemed awful. Yeah. So, like if I do sell one, this is going to be really bad. You know, it's like, what other, fa anything, what else do you no, want to dig into? That's just, I'm serious, that's number one. Where else do you want to go next? No, we, 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 we talked keep this, going we talked, here. We talked this morning and yeah. about, you know, knowing when to give up. Yeah. Not selling anything for six months is probably a good signal. So if you were to take, yeah, you map that learning down onto, onto startup grind, you know, if thing, things are going pretty good now, at what stage would you say, this isn't, this isn't working anymore, I, I gotta, gotta pull the plug? Yeah, only the founder knows when to pull the plug, but what you don't want to do is wait too long. And it, it, like, if you, if you if you got three months of cash and you haven't sold an ad, like, start looking now. Like, start figuring out the way out. So in the beginning, you're like, you're, you sort of are juggling five balls. And maybe you're like really throwing one high and the others are just little balls. But you kind of got to diversify because you don't know what's going to hit and what doesn't. This, I think this is, people will say it's a lack of focus, but I think it's just a natural evolution of not knowing what's going to work and what's not. And then at some point, you start either throwing balls out or you, like, because they suck, or because you start getting something that's working and you just wanna focus on that one thing. And so, in that case, what happened was a friend of mine from college came to me and he said, hey, we want you to do consulting for us for 20 hours a week. And, and I said, well, I'm focused on truck ads. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I've read all the magazines and they say, you gotta stay focused, so I can't deviate my focus. And he's like, well, just do 20 hours, it's not a big deal, like, you can still do it you can still work 40 hours on it a week. And, and, he, and he paid me enough that it paid for all my bills. So I was like, I have to do that. Like, I'm like letting down my family if I don't do that. So I did that. Then I was good at that. And that was what I had done. And it kind of like reminded me like, oh, this is a skill I'm actually like, don't suck at. Mm -hmm. And so then I started like, like throwing other balls in the air. We built this website and you know, and a friend, of I, a friend, a friend and I did that. And we, we started talking to Paul and we started like building a product for them. Like we're just trying stuff. Like, and and any of those could have become the thing, mm. but they didn't. And so when they ran its course, we throw them out and keep moving. And so you take a little bit of heat for that because people say like, you oh, you, you're just you're scattered. You're all over the place. But I I don't like you kind of have to do that in the beginning. Um, but at some point, and entrepreneurs make this mistake too. At some point, something m might start to hit, and then you really need to double down. And a lot of people then, they've been doing this kind of juggling balls for so long, it's, they get scared and of committing to something. Um, and, and so uh, I've never, it's, I'm grateful that's not a, that's a skill I, actually, I have. And um, I've never had a problem like just saying say no to lots of things. Um, and so when it, when it appeared Starground was a thing, we just doubled down on it and it didn't really look back. So you, you went on a Twitter rant there recently. Uh, um about opportunity. How, how, how do you sense then when something is an opportunity and not a distraction? How, what, what, what is that in, 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 you know, in your experience that's telling you? So I think that opportunity is more like a muscle than like an event, okay? So like you, wonder, you see like the same successful people having good things happen to them again and again and again and again. So are they just lucky? Yeah, there's some luck involved, but the same, like Peter Thiel, like, he starts PayPal, he gets into Stanford, you know, he starts PayPal, then he's the first in major investor in Facebook, then he starts Palantir, this is like the luckiest guy in the world, <laughs> right? Well, what, what I think is not that he's so lucky, but there are certain people, there's this book called uh, Mindset, which I'm, I'm just reading right now, which, it, which reinforces this idea if you wanna read about it, but it's, it's that there are certain people that when opportunity knocks, they always open the door. They don't always let that opportunity in the house, but they, they peek it open and say, what? You know? And it's like, if it's good, they'll open it a little bit more. And, and an, another way to look at this is like, I cold email billionaires to come speak at our event. Some of them don't respond, but a lot of them do. And it's because they have not shut themselves off to opportunity. Vinod Kosla who gives his email at every talk he ever speaks at. It is his email, that's how I got it. He reads his emails, he doesn't respond to them all, but if he likes it, he'll either respond or he'll send it to someone on his staff to get it all teed up. 
he, I mean, think about this. This guy founded Sun Microsystems, funded Square, Google, Excite, bunch of big companies. Like, he's still reading cold emails? Because he's still open to change. He's still open to seeing that, that he doesn't have all the answers. And so certain people that are flexing that muscle and working that muscle, they keep getting more and more opportunities. They're not saying yes to everything, but they're just listening. And then, and then other people are constantly keeping the door closed. And you probably have friends like this, who like you've tried to get involved in startups, they're like, man, startups would be so cool, I wanna do startup. It's like, well, here's a great opportunity. And like, oh man, I, I couldn't do it. You know, you're just, you, I'm just different, you know? Or like, it may even be something smaller. You might say like, hey, let's go to a sports game. And like, uh, I just did this with one of my friends. I said, hey, fly in for the, the Warriors finals game. And he said, and he's like the biggest Warriors fan in the world. He's like, I just can't do it. And I was like, how can you not do it? Like, you should just do it. It's like, you'll never forget it. It's this great opportunity, but he's, he kind of closes the door a lot, right? And so, um, so that's, that's all that is. It's just like, don't like, always open the door, listen. Don't just do everything. Like, take the data points of when you said yes and when you said no, and when you're right and when you're wrong. We've all done that. I was, I was offered to be the first, first non-founder at a company called Instructure that is like on the IPO a few years ago, it's worth $400 million. I was offered to be the first, like the fifth employee at this movie clips thing that my friend um, that I talked about earlier, the consulting thing, which sold for $20 million, and they spun out another business worth $500 million. So I was offered a 3% of a startup to be an advisor without paying anything, which is now valued at $50 million. I didn't take it. So, like those are kind of painful lessons for me, financial lessons, and I'm not, I'm not bankrolled, I haven't made a ton of money, but like I've now learned from those mistakes, right? Those are data points in my life of like, I shouldn't have taken those jobs. Those were good decisions. I should have taken the advisor equity. <laughs> Heck yeah, I regret that every night. But you know, but these are just, these are things you learn, and these are data points for you, and, but I always, always listen, never stop listening. Um, we just step back um, to to, uh, to leaving EA. I mean, like you were you, you're privileged enough to be able to step away from a job and, and a promotion opportunity, and not everybody gets that. And, and you said, you know, you stepped away from EA because you wanted to do a startup. What, what, what did that mean for you? Was it that you wanted to build a product that changed the world, or that you wanted to be in control of your destiny? You hated your boss and having to, to report up to somebody. All three. What's what's. Yeah, I mean, my core motivation is to take care of my family. So that's, you but, know. But you turned down a promotion opportunity. Yeah, that's a good question. And it took me four years to pay myself what I would have made had I stayed. Yeah. That's a, that's hard, that's, there was a lot of hard work in those four years. Um, and I still have a hard time just ta paying myself because I always reinvest. I'm just constantly trying to build. And so, um, and that comes from going for years without, for three years I didn't take any money out. We just figured out ways to survive and lived off savings. So, um, I think, um, you know, the corporate world was not, was not for me. And some of you can probably relate to that. It, it just, it, I, I, I could work there, I could be productive, I was helping grow that company. Um, I can get my boss. My bosses were fine, um, but it just—it wasn't for me. I was frustrated by the process. I was frustrated by the politics. I was frustrated by the speed. And ultimately, I wanted to be creative. I had ideas that were keeping me up at night, literally. And I said, I need to work on these. And once I did, I started sleeping through the night again. You—you you were four years at EA. Yeah. What, what what did you set out to to learn about yourself and achieve when you joined EA? I mean, you must have known it was a big corporate, right? So what? what I mean, honestly, I took the job at EA because a I didn't have a great startup idea out of college that I thought I could bet my whole family on, and two, I knew that if I went to EA, I would always have skills that would make me employable. I hedged on being able to always get a job and take care of my family. So I I remember one of the first. Uh, fireside chats that I saw you do in person at that first uh, global conference back in spring 13 was with Bing Gordon, uh, who you would have. Did you work with Bing at, at, at EA? No, I was like an intern and then the low guy. So okay. I mean, I, like he was like he wasn't a founder, but he was like there for 30 years kind of guy. Did, was was there some? Did, was there a feeling of poetic justice to go back and and and, and say? 
hey look I left and I built this incredible thing and I've got one of the founders of that, that previous company. It was cool I that I finally had a reason, like he had a reason to engage with me, yeah that is cool. Yeah. It's not, it, that was not, that's nice, I got the founder of EA to speak, you know, that was kind of cool. Um, yeah, that feels good, yeah. you know. So uh, I, I don't dwell on that stuff. Like I'm not a bitter person. I, I like I'm I'm happy for other people's success. That's something too. Like that I we should celebrate each other. This is a community that's that's um, like a community that I came from, where pe everyone kind of knows each other. You kind of know each other's families in a lot of cases. Like you know, you just are very tight, and it's very easy to to pick up, pick people apart. It's very easy to hate, and. Um, you know, and, and I haven't heard anybody, hey, well, I've been here, I'm not like making a point of that, other than to say like, like when somebody's successful, when somebody sell, sells their company, I always hope I'm the first guy that emails them. Like, that's awesome. Because I know there's a lot of people that say, oh, they, she succeeded, she took my success. Like, now I'm, what am I gonna get? And you're like bitter about it. That's like, like we don't all drink from one success well. Okay, like you taking some success out of the well is not gonna like mean my family's is gonna get less success. Well, water, whatever it is, <laughs> Guinness, with success Guinness. Okay, um, we're losing them. This is not good. Oh boy, I, I lost them with the Guinness thing. I'm sorry for offending. Uh, I just feel terrible. Um, um, so, you know. We should celebrate each other's success, okay? Now, if it's your direct competitor, okay, maybe you're not so stoked about that. But like, if somebody succeeds, let them know it's awesome. Give them, go get them a little gift, send them something, send them flowers, send them like some balloons, like send them an email at the very least, it takes five seconds, you know? And, and, and you know, we're all, we're all in this thing together. You've interviewed some incredible thinkers and, and influencers, leaders of our time. Um, I, I was there when you were about to step on stage back in February to interview Clayton and, and, and Mark uh, from uh, Andreessen Horowitz. And two things surprised me. Um, the first was you were wearing a shirt, and, and that kind of just blew my mind. I got really worried. Um, and then the second was that you looked really nervous. Uh, and, and, and again, that was, I was nervous. nervous. Yeah. What, what were you nervous of at that stage? What was, was the it? biggest moment in our company's history? right there in that manifestation on stage. And I'd been thinking about it for four months. And I wore a shirt, a collared shirt. I, you're talking, I wore a shirt. I usually don't wear a shirt when I'm doing it. So that's what you kind of implied, that you just were surprised seeing a shirt. But I was wearing a collared shirt because one of the, Clay Christensen, who's like the, the top business thinker of the last 50 years, like as ranked by whoever ranks those things, really PhD people somewhere. Um, He's like wearing a suit, so I kind of felt. I still wore Jordans, you know. I'm not. I have. I wore. I have my other shoes that I brought Jordans. So I don't wear Jordans, but I still wore like high top Jordan shoes. So I felt like I didn't totally betray my, you know, my authenticity of who I am. Right? Okay, it was a black collared shirt, but I but I wore bright red Jordans. No, well, that was. I felt like. What was a good compromise? What, what, what were you worried would happen? I mean, like what was what was the negative impact of that for you going to be? I mean, like you know, you, you of the shirt? No, of, of, of <laughs> your nerves. Right? The so negative impact of the shirt would be my mom would be like, "What is this deal?" And she's like sitting right there. So like I didn't want to like take heat from my mother. Your parents were there? Yeah, I don't know. of course. Right. No. So what was the the worry for you? I mean, like you've built up this successful community. One interview isn't going to kill it. I'm interviewing Mark Andreessen. That doesn't f just keep, put a little fear in you. I would be terrified. The dude that. is like smart, smarter than whatever you're an expert in. He's smarter than you about it. <laughs> <laughs> like ten minutes with him in the green room, and my brother's a film producer in Hollywood, and he was like, "Oh yeah, I did, you know, The Lone Survivor, and I did Mother's Day, and this and that." And he's like, "Oh yeah, and this," and then Mark like, "Oh yeah, well, what well, do you know that uh, you know the the Driftwood did this, 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 and I read this book of this, 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 and like I just he's just sitting there like, "Oh yeah, that's cool." <laughs> like he's like a Hollywood producer, and like Mark, he's like, and then like some other random topic comes up about the roads, and he's like, "Oh, well, you do you know that when the concrete mixes with the blah blah blah?" He's like, "Dude, what are you talking? It's like it's like he's got those 
Google contact lenses and like all the stuff is coming across his eyes and we can't see it and he's just repeating as fast as he can. He so, talks like so fast too. It's just like, uh, like I'm so stupid because yeah, you're talking so fast. That, 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 that challenge is sort of like, you know, managing Clay and Mark side by side. Oh, yeah, Clay had a stroke like five years ago and so he, and he's really thoughtful and he kind of talks like this and he just starts going really, really, really deep, deep down into the earth, very deep down into the core of the earth. And then you're like, oh my gosh, he lost me at the crust. <laughs> and he's down in the, what is it, the mantle or what is it called? I mean, see, I'm not that smart. Um, so here I am with these two brilliant guys and like, I'm wearing Jordans, you know, so I'm a little nervous. How do you prepare for that so What did you do during those four months? Just a lot of rocking in the fetal position in the corner, <laughs> crying, um, you know, um, a lot of psychiatry psychiatry bills um, if you just prepare if you're prepared you won't fear you just spend a lot of time preparing and I've done hundreds of interviews so it wasn't the first it was my first rodeo and I know that if I spend 10 hours preparing on a talk and an interview it will be great I usually don't but that one I did so you know I, it was fine I, I, so just go, go, going back then when did you first step back from being Derek, the interviewer, and being Derek, the community leader, CEO of Grind. When did you when did you start handing that over to people? Because you don't you don't you don't do all the interviews anymore. Well, I always knew from the beginning I don't scale. So, um, you know, I I was never going to do the interviews. I've never been here before, and we've been doing it off and on for four years, <laughs> right? So, oh, we're losing more guys. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Sorry, man. I was a Googler too, he's pretty smart on it. Um, so, you know, so like I can't go to Tehran and do the interview, you know, for lots of reasons. Um, so like, if it didn't work with people on the ground, it, it, so it was always, I always said it's better for me to just be in the garage, training people, working with people, and trying to grow the community. So the first 250 events internationally, I didn't attend any of them. And I've lived outside the US for eight years, I don't have a fear of traveling, uh, but I just was very, paranoid that I couldn't be the reason that it worked. It had to be these great people that we have locally and I probably took it too far. I did take it too far. I wish I had gotten out sooner, but the, the, my hypothesis was correct. Sorry, so when, you, when you say that again, you took it too far in terms of... I probably should have like done a hundred events internationally and then started going out and meeting with people and learning from communities like this. I learned, the, part of this is selfishly for me to talk to you and meet you all and see how we can do better and and hang out, hang out with David, and you know, and just be a sounding board of what we're doing wrong and what we're doing right. Um, talk, talk, talk about the process of. of I suppose there's, there's two things here. We're going to talk about the values. We always do the sort of the values chat at the end of this, but the values are incredibly important for you, uh, and, and and the growth of this, and also in terms of onboarding new directors. So. You presumably were involved in bringing all the early directors on. The first 125 directors, I approved personally. What was that process like? Grueling. For who? <laughs> For me. <laughs> Hearing this, talking to, uh, to get to 125, I probably had to talk to, I don't know, 250, 300 people, I don't know. Well, so what were you looking for? Um, people like us. People with our mindset, people with our values. I, I did not, it, it wasn't until three years ago I understood why values were very important. Values are a magnet uh, to attract people like you. And when you're trying to get your startup ball rolling down the hill, you need people like you as quickly as possible and it's very hard to convince anyone to join your startup. It's hard for anyone to convince anyone to join their startup. So. Um, if, if you're at least clear about who you are, then when people see it on your website, they can say, oh, I'm not like, I'm not like her or that founding team, so next. But if they see it and if it, resonates, if it resonates with them, you can actually get people to who may have just kept going to stop and say, oh, I want to be part of that. That's cool. That's, that represents who I am. And so, um, so when we put the values on the website, that's one of the most important things we ever did. And it, it unlocked a flood of new people and, and people like that we got right on the first city. That like, like this guy from Toronto, I mean, I, I, I kind of say it's dumb luck, but 
You know, like we had lots of those kinds of experiences where we found the right person and it was the only person that ever applied. And it's because they saw our website and they said, we said like, why'd you apply? And I said, well, I saw it and it looked cool. And then I saw your values and I was like, that's me. And I want to be with people like that. And we just, they were all out there. We didn't, we, you, I don't know that you can teach people to like whole new set of core values. Like you need to kind of piggyback off of what they already got. And so we just tapped into that and just we just kind of gathered all those people together. So I, I, I've talked to some of the directors and, 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 and you know, from, from, from chapters around the world and, and they would say, if Derek hadn't built the grind or if the grind wasn't there, I would have done it anyway. It would have been less codified or I was probably doing it sure. anyway. So how, how much of what you look for in a director is they're doing it already or they would go and do it or I can possibly coach this person a little bit to be stronger around certain values. They just need to be the, the I mean, they need to have the values and they kind of need to be in the right phase of their career and, um, you know, we've done it enough to know what some things that work and some things that don't work and then we still test and try new things and we'll try a random person say, they don't know, we would normally try this person but let's try it and see if it works and most of the time that fails spectacularly. But um, but we still try and test different things. So, how how did the this was the values the values define the community as much as the directors themselves? How how did the values map onto Startup Grind as a company? You know because you know a company will have its own values in terms of how you engage with your employees. We're not employees; we're, we're part of the product, I guess. So, do the, do the values map into the the team internally as well, or do you have separate? Values? Yeah, sure. No, we use the same thing. Okay. Absolutely. So what, what when do you, again then when you're using those values do you use the values when you're hiring for the team as well as when you're hiring? Yes, for the absolutely, hundred percent. Okay. Okay. Cool. And we do different things to see. I, I had a recent case where we were hiring an engineer, and he had a requirement where he could not, would not work on Saturday under any circumstances, and and that was fine. But I gave him a scenario that was the lead engineer, the CTO's wife's in the hospital, um, pregnant. The other guy is on a vacation, his first vacation in months, um, and the servers go down. Would you, what would you do? And um, if I, and so what he said was, he said, well, I'm under no circumstances will work Saturday, so it's gonna be down. <laughs> Can imagine how stoked I was about that. <laughs> oh, great, you know. And like, as soon as it goes down, we know, because like, there's people all over the world, like, you know, our guy in Israel starts like ringing his Tel Aviv bell and like, you know, hey, the website down. You know, and somebody else somewhere around, the, and it's like, we can't sell tickets and this and that. I can't send a newsletter. And, and so the, the answer that we didn't hire him, I was gonna extend him an offer, but because of his response to that, it was like the last interview. What I would have expected him to say was something that showed that he was more thoughtful and that he would give first. And that could have been, hey, well, I could teach you how to do it. I'll spend time with you, me, and teach you how to do it. So if it goes down, you could do it. Mm -hmm. Or I will always have a friend on call who could do it. Or um, just problem solving around like being thoughtful about the other team members. Like just giving and helping them. And he could have made up anything he wanted. But just that he showed that he was a thoughtful guy and not so stubborn about this one thing. He didn't have to compromise his values. Um, you know, this other value that was important to him about not working on Saturday, um, but he didn't. He showed no thoughtfulness, and I just said that's not somebody I want to work with. Earlier, you mentioned when I was talking to you about why you wanted to, to go and start something when you left EA. You mentioned your family, and and it was one of the things that struck me. You know, uh, when, when I came to the second conference, and you brought your family up on stage, and you 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 you're very open about sharing the, the fact that you know you're a family guy, and you've got this family around you, and you. Embrace that. <clears throat> I tried to hide it, but it's just—it's hard to hide your kids. Yeah, they, 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 they don't really like the cover. It, you know, it, it yeah. doesn't work. Um, How many people in here have kids? Raise your hands. Okay, so maybe forty percent. Um, just throw me. Um, oh yeah. So just to go back to the, the the previous point, a red line. What's what's the red line for you then in terms of this is my family time that's impinging on my family space. How, how do you how do you manage? Well, there's this book by Clayton Christensen again. Do, who knows who Clayton Christensen is? Do people know who he is? Okay, so he wrote Innovator's Dilemma. Anyone heard of that book? You need if you need to all read this book if you haven't read it. Um, but he's also written this other book called How You Measure Your Life. 
and he, he's a Harvard guy, and he talks about how when he went back to his 10, re, 10 or 15 year reunion, here's some of the smartest people in the world, right? And he went to school with um, uh, Jeffrey Skilling, who was the CEO of Enron in the United States. Anybody heard of Enron? Okay, mo a lot of you. Okay, so this guy's in jail, right? And like, and then there's these other people who like, they come with their wife at the 10 year, and then they don't come back to the 20, and he's like, well, where are they? And it's like, well, other people would say, well, he didn't want to come because, um, you know, his wife hates him and his kids hate him too, and so they live on the other side of the country and he just didn't want to come. And so what he says is, is he's like, you know, these are really smart people who didn't make bad decisions, they just didn't make the best decisions <laughs> along the way. Like Jeffrey Skilling didn't go to Harvard, and he did, if you would he would not leave Harvard thinking I'm gonna I like I'm gonna go to jail in 15 years. Like here we go. Like this was not his plan, but he made and he made great decisions along the way to a point, and then something happened. So it's like so, okay. So the three things he says is that you that you don't want to mess up. He says you you want to optimize around not having your wife uh, leave you or your husband leave you not having your kids hate you, and not going to jail. Okay? If, you, if you just focus on those three things, it sounds stupid, right? But, it, but think about it. Like, I know people whose kids hate them. Like, my family, whose kids hate a member of my family, you know? Um, I, and, you know, we all, have, we all know people whose wives or husbands hate their ex-wives or husbands or whatever. So, like, for me, like the whole thing is about the is like taking care of my family. So like if I screw that up, then like I kind of defeated the purpose of doing all this, hor putting myself through this horrible thing that's called a startup. So what I do is I just have certain checks in place that that I think keep me in balance. Um, and I'm ten years, I'm I'm seven years in for me entrepreneur. So find me in seven more years, and I'm I've got myself on record, and I hope I don't fail. But I don't, I'm not, I don't know, I've got to do it. Can you uh, unpack those checks? What is yeah, I mean, that? one of them is I always try to have dinner with my kids. And I, wor and I go to extreme measures to do that. Um, and a good example of that is when we went to Atlanta two nights ago, uh, Coca-Cola, we were meeting with them, they bought a hotel room for us to go. And I want to have dinner with my kids. So I had dinner with my kids, got them in bed, and then I left at nine o'clock, so I take a red eye and then have a meeting at 9 a.m. the next morning. So we arrived, we showered at that hotel. Thank you, Coca-Cola, for the hotel room. Um, we went to the meeting and gave an hour-long presentation at 9 o'clock. Um, and then we took a red eye the next night to get here. You know, um, and so um, that's, that's just one little thing. And I don't know that that's really like, that's a tactical thing I do. I don't, I'm not saying that's, it. I don't even know if that's a good idea, honestly. Like, there, there are negative effects that come from that. Like, somebody told me tonight, like, I look like I needed to get some sleep. Um, so, maybe that would have been better. Um, but, like, that's something I do. And, like, I try not to sleep. Like, I try not to, like, if I can sleep in my own bed, I do everything I can to sleep in my own bed. Like, and, like, I, it's just a good policy for, for me as a married guy to sleep at home. This is something that's good for me to do. And, like, I'm... I think I'm a reasonably good guy and I good to my wife, but like that's just good policy for me, so I do that. Um, you know, I don't know, just little lots of little stuff like that. You know, like that works for me. So figure out what works for you, but like don't abandon your relationships because when your startup fails, which it m almost certainly will, all of your startups will m almost certainly fail. Okay, at least at the end of it, hopefully you've still got your friends and your family to fall back on. So you don't say, like, I've just wasted the last five years. I've got nothing to show for it, right? And people say, like, how can you have kids while you have a startup? And it's like, well, because when my startup fails, at least I still got my kids, you know? And, like, so I make it work. And, you know, that's just part of life. Like, life's hard. You've got to prioritize what's important to you. And, and, but, like, you know, and I just I read these blog posts about founders who then, like, they just go crazy into their, their bubble of doing their startup, and then they come out and, like, their, fan, their parents and their siblings like don't even really know them anymore. And it's our fault as founders for those things. What has been unexpectedly hard for you over the last seven years as you've grown the grind? What, 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 what did you not foresee? That it would take this long. That it takes so, so long. 
and you feel like you hit like, oh, it's gonna do it, and then like, you get an email the next morning, and it's like, crap, <laughs> like, never mind, false alarm. <laughs> Um, I legitimately believed that I would be on like on a cover of a magazine within two years. Not that that even matters. I don't. I don't aspire to that. It doesn't matter to me anymore. But that like that would have like a, a moment of success for me. Like I'll be. So, I will like I'll be there in a couple years because I had been successful at a big company, which is so insulated. I, I like. I think if I went back and unpacked all the things I did at that company, I probably was like not that good. Um, but because it's so insulating, you can kind of hide all your mistakes, you know? And so, um, but I just assume like, man, I did the com big company thing so well, start things, just gonna, I'm just gonna crush it. And then like, failure after failure after failure after failure after failure. And then you, you're kind of like a starving person that just, it just eventually like you don't need food. Like that's kind of where I got to with money, where it's like, and maybe some of you can relate to this, like you just haven't had money in so long, you just don't need money anymore. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, not buying new clothes for the 24th month in a row, so just wear the old suit again, you know, or whatever, you just get, you kind of like, and so I'm, I like, I remember, the founder always remembers taking out the trash, even when you don't need to take the trash out anymore. You always remember that. That's, ben, that's from Ben Horace's book. I didn't come up with that. But it, that resonates with me, because when Francisco and I, who was, was the first employee and on the founding team, raise your hand, Francisco, he and I were in the garage alone for a year and a half. And like, I don't say that as like some cool Palo Alto badge of honor garage thing. Like, we were there because we had no money to have an office. And there was a lot of times it was not fun to be in a garage in the summer or in the winter, and like your fingers are too cold to type. Um, and so like we remember taking out the trash we remember mopping the garage floor we remember like hearing the rats up above the garage it's not like oh you come work with us in the garage where when it's really quiet you'll hear the rats scampering around <laughs> when do you start <laughs> you know so and, and just to flip the question then what what did you foresee that was going to be difficult but actually turned out very easy what was what has been easy over the last seven years, or has it all been a grind? Um, I think it's easy to, uh, I don't know, I don't know. That's a great question. Okay, keep it in your head. We'll okay. pause for a minute, and, and uh, I'm gonna go out to the floor for some questions. Mm -hmm. We've got time yet. Uh, I've used the only mics we have, unfortunately, so just stand up and shout your question. <coughs> We have some time. Any questions? Uh, how does, uh, does, does Starkboy make money or what's your Gosh, we make money? money? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is this you speak of? <laughs> Euros and dollars? Uh, so, most, almost all of our events are paid events. Thank you all for buying a ticket tonight or taking a free code because David was wanted to fill the room. Um, I don't know, I haven't looked, I'm sure, I don't know who paid, who didn't pay, but all, most of our, our events are all supposed to be paid. And, um, and then we have our conferences, which, which make money, and then we have partnerships like Google for Entrepreneurs, we're a global partner of theirs, we're one of their two global partners with Startup Weekend. And um, so we work with IBM and Salesforce and Coke and all sorts of people like that. Um, and we also have a software product that we use for us and, and we license that as well to other people. And so we make, make money off that as well. Hi. I sort of have the hey. two questions. The first one is very quick. My name is John, by the way. Hey, John. Thanks you look, look sharp. Straight from Thanks for dressing up for <laughs> the event. <laughs> um, oh, first of all, will you do the Australian accent first? Groggies! <laughs> 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 no, I don't have enough. No. All right. Tell us, sorry. Come on, say, tell, tell us. But no, you, all you, of my you, accents you are the same. <laughs> so Francisco's laughing because, like, the Mexican accent, the Australian accent, the Pakistani accent, the American accent, they're all, the French guy, they all sound exactly the same. So it's really not that good. Right. And I'm sure I will offend, I probably already offended people by just saying what I just said. So. All right, fair enough. Uh, my real question is then, I suppose, so you said you like to hire like minded people and people who kind of get the same way as you um, and buy the same values. So where do you kind of draw the line between hiring people who will say yes to you and almost borderline sycophantic at times to 
sort of not hiring naysayers at the same time? You know, where is that sort of line? Man, and at the beginning, and I, it's a great question because in the beginning, you just, you kind of, like I said with the directors, you kind of got to take what you can get. You know, I mean, if they've got, if they can code and they got, you know, two legs and two arms and, you know, and a brain that's semi-functioning, um, on drugs, not on drugs, uh, you'll take them, right? You just maybe don't lock them down to a long-term contract. <laughs> you know, like, don't give them a ton of equity uh, at first. Um, Google, there's this great, uh, there's this great thing that Google has uh, that they say when they're hiring, and that is that, um, a manager's pain is never so great that you have to compromise on who you hire. So think about that, like, that's really hard when you're two people trying to get a product to MVP. It's so hard. And you just, and I've hired, I have, uh, I've hired so many bad people. Um, but uh, but it's, it's a good thing to reflect on. And, you know, and is this person going to, because if you hire the wrong person, you might waste three months or six months or whatever. And who knows? They might be a real jerk and they might sue you if you fire, when you fire them. Then you're, then you're like, then you're even deeper, right? So, so now if you had the luxury then uh, in your position now, seven years down the line, would you sort of look for somebody who would be sort of, you know, if you said something to them to say yes and, and then they build on whatever your kind of initial idea was, or would you say something, say look for somebody who would maybe challenge you and say, oh, I think this is a great idea, and say no because we should do this, or whatever, so would you kind of... There's a certain like chemistry that has to exist at the earliest level. You cannot fight about everything. Yeah. Like, oh, I don't like the way the logo looks. We just have a different design aesthetic. That, you're gonna waste so much time and like some of those things just have to fall in place. You you know you want people to challenge you, right? Yeah. But some of those things you need to fall in place. The advice I got very early on before I left EA was I talked to this guy um, who'd sold his company for tens of millions of dollars and he said, look what you need to do because I didn't have a, co a technical side at the time. And he said, you need to go out and you should go interview, take 70 engineers to lunch. He used that number, I don't know why, but he said, take 70 engineers to lunch and then you beg the best two to join your company and to work with you. That's exactly what I did. And it took me like a year and a half to meet with that many engineers. And I begged the best two to work with me. There was one guy that had worked on Gmail. There was one guy that had worked at Apple. And um, I spent months trying to, those were the guys. And it didn't end up working out, but it, it was okay. I got to know engineers. I got to talk to these people. I got to figure out who's BSing, who knows what they're talking about, I got to vet my idea, all these kinds of things. Um, but just getting out there and, and, and in our values, I could have done this better, but if you go to these people that you need their skill set and say, how can I help you, and genuinely help them, then maybe they won't work with you in June, but maybe when their startup implodes in September, they'll want to go back to lunch with you because you seem like a cool person and you were somebody that they liked, you know? So, um, but uh, if you can find A players, and this is why like people you know from college, people that you, like the co-founder relationship is a trust relationship, right? It's all built on trust. I can't introduce you to somebody and say, you guys should be co-founders, because you might trust me, but you don't even know them. So like this whole like date your co-founder, like go to co-founder dating networking things, I, like they don't make any sense to me because you know, it's, it's like walking into a bar and asking someone if they'll have kids with you, you know? <laughs> It's like, I just met you, creep, you know? Or they might say yes. <laughs> Depends on which bar, I guess. How much Guinness they're drinking. Um, the, that black, the dark stuff, I think that, if they had a few of those. Yeah. What's that called? Oh, the, um, the export one we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, but anyways, like, you gotta build that trust. That might take six months. Meet somebody great, just start building the, just like, we could work together in two years, three years, four years. To start building that relationship. And then when you need to call it in, you have a great idea, or maybe you want to like, hey, let's brainstorm, let's do something together. And then, you know, don't, you don't have to force it. Thanks. Pat. Derek, as um, director of a relatively new network, a new grind, uh, Limerick. So he uh, says it as well. It's an Irish. He was just saying it because we talked about it. Yeah. The grind in Limerick. Uh, it's been a great platform, a great campfire around which to build a startup community. So, Thanks uh, for what you're doing there. Um, 
everybody looks to the valley and has the has the network globally had the opposite um, sort of cross pollination have chapters around the world brought ideas and startup communities that the valley could learn from Oh, absolutely. We spent this afternoon at this angel summit and I kind of went off on bootstrapping versus raising funding. This is something that the Valley is now going to learn the hard way. Um, and all these great companies that have just hunkered down and built a real business where they make real money. Um, this is a really revolutionary concept. Uh, like every business before, you know, HP, like they're, they had to figure out how do I build this thing without much help? Am I get a small business loan or something? But, um, you know, M McDonald's, Coke, like Ford, these people just figure out how to make money from the beginning and build as they had resources to do it. And that's something that uh, there are dozens of companies outside the Valley that are great at that. And there are very few that have done it that way in the Valley because of the cycle that we're in there. So I'm kind of curious about the uh, various countries that Startup Grind is operating in. Have you noticed that um, the countries that are more ready to engage in, Do you want to just start in, in startup businesses? You know, uh, some countries have more, more strict regarding bankruptcy in that. Have you noticed different countries? Well, sure. Countries? Like in Norway, there's no incentive to start a company because everyone's rich. <laughs> like it's a, it's like you, your life will be worse even if your startup is successful. Like in bankruptcy, you have to wait 12 years up to the years up for yourself for another one. The States with Chapter 11, you can start straight away. The different countries want to Yeah, terms. our old friend Donald Trump's been a good example of that. Um, you know, in France, like you're ridiculed for start, you know, for starting a company. There's not an incentive to get rich in France. Like everyone that's rich wants to leave. You know, so um, uh, and uh, you know, and there are there so and there are communities like this. It's like I can't believe how much is going on here. I mean, it's just incredible. Like. The amount, I mean, it's just decades of work that's gone into this, into Dublin. And as somebody that's never been here, it's just amazing to come in and see that. And uh, versus like even a city like Atlanta, which is probably a much bigger city in population, but is way, way behind Dublin, not even close. Um, and, you know, you, Dublin would be right at the top of all the cities in the world that has figured out how to bring innovation and they had to make a lot of big investments to do that. So, um, but I might just jump in on a question there. Like, do you, do you see then places like local authorities, city governments, national authorities would approach you and pay you to come in and do a grind, even if it didn't make sense to you from a local community perspective? I just don't like being beholden to people's interests. So uh, we have talked to governments about things like that. And we might do it at some point, but like I, I, well, we, we like, I think we're like the United Nations. It's like I don't have like a real strategic partnership with the U.S. government. It's not because I don't, I'm not hoorah on the U.S. Uh, of course, I'm American. Um, and I love my country. That was a great American. And I love my country. <laughs> That's my like Will Ferrell, George Bush impression. Um, but it's just like I want to be the United Nations, so we're Switzerland. And I can work with people in Iran and I can work with people in Palestine. I'm probably not working with people in North Korea. Uh, but. Uh, but most, but our governments don't even, you know, we can't even get along with any of those people. So we've been work, we've had chapters in Iran for a long time. It may end up getting us in trouble, but I don't really care. Like it's the right thing to do. Helps entrepreneurs, so we're going to do it. We start, we don't make any money. NSA, if you're listening, we've never taken a dollar out of Iran. We don't want money from Iran. Uh, don't misconstrue misconstrue any conversations I've ever had on Skype about this conversation, this type of thing. Um, uh, we just want to help entrepreneurs, and that's a good way of us showing that. Ramallah, Palestine, I was there two years ago. Anybody been to the West Bank? It's awful. It's awful. It's a terrible place, honestly. I mean, the people that survive there are ten times stronger than me. And you walk into this event and start grinding, third floor of this little building in Ramallah. It's like you're walking into Dublin. CTOs in the front row, engineers, like, it's just it's inspiring, you know? We don't want. We don't care about money. We just. It's the right thing to do, so we do it. And if it's to work with the government, then we would do it if it was in the best interest of our directors and our our community. Go ahead. All right. So, uh, 
Hey everybody, my name is Daniel. I'll let's hear it on three. Everybody, hey Daniel, one, two, three. Hey Daniel. Hey Daniel. So I'm going to go ahead and open up one of the doors that he's talking about. Um, I'm here on behalf of Startup Weekend, which is the second partnership for startups that Google has. Um, and you all are lucky. The next event is tomorrow, and it's downstairs. We feel lucky. It, you should feel pretty lucky. Um, I also have the American accent. This is the second of three of these events I'm going to be throwing. So, Good to see you, brother. So, so I encourage you to. You get in a fight or something? Let me know. I got your back. Fair enough. Hoorah! Um, so, what I would encourage you to do is Google Startup Weekend Dublin, and I will make a bet for you. If you show up, the tickets are currently sold out. We will make a spot for you. Ah, and if you can't. And see me again. My name is Daniel. Uh, this is one we'll of the opportunities of hustling for a startup, an idea, something like that. Uh, this is your opportunity. Get it done. Open the door. Do something. Thank you, Daniel, for the pitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of more questions from Ida and then this girl here. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, could, could please. Yeah. Oh, you. <laughs> Of my go for it. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of door related also. Um, I was just wondering why you didn't take the advisory job, and also you're talking about opening the door to everything. What makes you open the door a little bit more to certain opportunities? Um, I didn't take it because I was totally focused on being an entrepreneur, and I feel like a lot of people use the term startup advisor, which is like the easiest thing in the world to say. I'm a startup advisor. Like I don't even know what that means. It's doesn't. It's it's completely immaterial to me. Um, and I didn't want to lose focus on being an entrepreneur. Um, and and I, I, I don't do it very much, but you know I'm starting to do some of that now um, because I can just be more helpful to entrepreneurs that way. I'm already doing it. I already do it a lot. So if somebody wants me to be part of their success, I shouldn't I should not accept that. So, um, but yeah, it's about focus. Eat about in the back. Yeah, yeah. eat at the back. Don't wave the mic. Hi, Edith. How are you? Good. Good. You seem like a happy person. I am. You look at your big smile. It's because she doesn't work for Google anymore. I used to work for Google, <laughs> and two months ago I left Google to no our second city, and I'm a startup community manager down in Cork. And awesome. So if anybody wants to start a startup in Cork, we should talk. Um, I could um, I guess what I was thinking about is I, I like to know how startups deal with uh, difficult kind of users or customers. And I suppose in your sphere that, that turns into like how do you deal with the difficult interviewee? Uh, mm. What's the worst one you've had, and how did you get through it? I thought you were going to talk talk about customer service, um, which I just say I still answer a lot of the customer service. It's a good way for me to get the pulse on things. Um, it's bad because sometimes I'm a little slow, slower than I used to be, but. I love seeing founders responding to customer service quick. Like great founders respond to customer service in a matter of minutes, hours, and um, they don't respond with I'm the founder. And they just say like they just start talking, and then you look up their name, and you realize it was the founder. Um, it's good for investors too. Investors will test you on those things on your website and see if you're kind of buttoned up on those things. Um, but uh, the worst interview, I, once I had an interview, I literally like came this close to falling asleep. <laughs> During the interview, I was like pinching. I was like gripping my leg, like underneath, like pinching as hard as I could, because I was just like, like great, putting myself, inflicting great pain, and um, it was just terrible. He was so boring, um, and no one. I just like I felt bad for everybody that was there. Um, and then one time I was interviewing Dave McClure, the first time I interviewed him, and we we're talking for like five minutes, and he just goes like. I was like asking him questions about his life and stuff, and he just looks at me. He's like, "This is effing boring, dude." <laughs> and it was like 250 people in the room, and I was like, turned bright red and like started sweating a little bit, which if you're bald is not good because like there's nowhere to hide. Um, and so I like it was. It ended up being a, a kind of a fun interview, like 15 minutes later, but it was very stressful for the next 15 minutes. So. But he's Dave's great. He's been very. He's spoken at like. I don't know, 10 or 15 star brands since then, so it's got a really good heart. One or two more questions, gentlemen here. Just, do you want to just stand up and shout? Sure. Uh, so, um, as startups and, and starting a company becomes a really popular thing around the world, there are yeah. more and more events like this and more and more experts coming out of the woodwork and people offering advice. Um, 
and I sometimes worry that there, there's, there's so many mailing lists, so many events, and so many speakers who claim expertise, and I, but often many of them are talking about things like innovation or, or startups or starting things, and many of them actually have never done anything like that and actually don't know what innovation and startups <coughs> are really and how actually difficult it is. So um, do you have an opinion on that? And my second point uh, or question would be, um, I guess you're kind of like the manager of a, an offline social network in a way. Social networks have lots of great things that happen within them, but also some negative things. And have you an experience of having to exclude people or leaders or participants? And how did that work? Or did your core values really keep you um, aligned and going through that? And maybe you haven't had that. Just curious. What's the heck of a question? Yeah, um, there's a couple things in there. The, the last one, um, one of them. One of the things I've learned is you never yell to volunteer, um, which again seems like oxymoron, but actually you'd be surprised. Um, and I've only ever really yelled at one director and he really deserved it and that was the last time he ever did anything with us. Um, so that's like, I've only ever like removed a couple of people and it's usually because of money issues, which we have basically zero tolerance policy for people to, to do funny things with money. Um, and uh, so, so that's that's how I answer that. But it, it's and it can be hard because some people underperform, and you you just you can't you got to find ways to motivate them or to let them move on. And um, that's something we could do a better job at. Um, your other question, I'm trying to remember actually what it was. What well, was it? Advisors and people who are, you know, you know, advising on innovation, entrepreneurship. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Themselves. Quality of speakers. Look, there's a lot of events, and like. We only do this kind of event, it's education. So like, I think workshops are great, but we don't do them. And I think hackathons are great. We don't do them. I, I can't go to a hackathon on a weekend because I got little kids and I got stuff to do. It's not good for me, but that doesn't mean it's not good for other people. So we focus on what we do and we try to be great at that one thing. Um, in terms of speakers, like we strive to have the best speakers in the world, you know, and, and we've, Proven that we can do that. Uh, you know, our lineup that we do in Silicon Valley every year at our conference is rivals uh, Recode in terms of speakers. I'm a little bit jealous of their lineup, but like there are there are one or two conferences that have better better quality of speakers than us, and we are relentless about saying yes and no, and people can't buy their way on stage and that kind of thing. We, we have hundreds of speakers that apply to speak at our events every year, and almost none of them actually get to speak. Um, and to your point, the same, the same things you say are the things we care about. Are, like, did you do it? Is it real? Or are you just like trying to market yourself or something and it's not, you know. And we, and great, and we, but we give our directors full control over basically selecting who those people are. We see it, we'll comment on it if we think it's, they're not doing a great job at it, but most of them do. And it's really important if, if they pick bad speakers, people don't come, so. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just call a halt to the questions because I'm kind of conscious of time. But Derek and uh, Guillaume G sitting over there on the couch, new to sleep, and Francisco and myself and Pat, we're all going to be hanging around here for the rest of the evening. So if you've got questions about the grind, come up and chat to us. Um, we'd, we'd be happy to talk. I want to wrap up with a couple of questions. I just want to, you want I just to, want to say one more thing because I've been forgetting this today. My email is Derek at Starbrand, D E R E K at Starbrand.com. That's my only email. Um, there is one other email that I send the emails with. It's Derek A at startupgrind.com, which I also check, but that's not my email. My email is Derek at startupgrind.com. If I can be useful or helpful, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. But in the spirit of an OCOS law, I'll read it and try to be thoughtful about it. Um, if you'll be thoughtful about what you write in the email, and and that I, you know, if you say, hey, like I think you'd be a great uh, advisor for my biotech company, I think well. I don't think you read my biography. What about truck ads? Um, about truck, truck ads. ads. Truck ads. Well, I would be, um, I I would be a good a good advisor for that. But unfortunately, when I when I throw the balls out that I'm juggling because they're bad, I also promise myself I will not spend another minute thinking or working on it. And I have been pretty true to that for the last four years on, no, seven years on truck ads. So if you want my deck. Happy to give it to you. I'll sign any agreement you want that says you own it and I don't. Um, it's your baggage after that. That's a and, bargain, uh, right? A deck so that, it's, the, it's, the deck that landed no sales. Wow. I got loads of those. Um, what's, 
What's next for Startup Grind? Are, have you plans to do 47,000 people in the city in Portugal with a massive big conference anytime soon? <laughs> um, well, if we were going to do a conference, a big conference of that size in Europe, we would definitely do it in Dublin. All right. Um, uh, <laughs> we're trying to be us. Like, I am what I am, you know? And we're authentic to who we are. And there are things we're better at than anybody else, and we're, there are things that we're not. Other people are better than us, you know? Um, the conferences facilitate the community. So that's how we look at the conferences. Um, but really, our bread and butter is these local events like this. We're doing, a, we do three or four of these a night. Nobody else in the world does that, except for like TEDx, you know? Um, and they've been around 30 years. We've been around four. So, you know, you sometimes you, you think, and one of the questions kind of like this, like, oh, everybody's like, what about all these events? Well, we do what we do. It's not like everyone else. Yes, they're all events, but all hamburgers weren't created equal. Like a McDonald's hamburger, which will probably kill you, it, it does not taste like an In-N-Out burger. If you've ever been to California, they're, they're both burgers, but they're just different. And some people might like McDonald's better, but I don't, I don't know those people. Um, <laughs> um, Short-term decisions, go to McDonald's. Uh, Long-term decisions. Can you stop talking about food? I'm starving. Go to, <laughs> um, the, the, the ultimate thing for the grind, we want to educate every entrepreneur in the world. We, that's where we're at now. To your point of, we didn't know that in the beginning, that wasn't the plan, but we've evolved into that. And we help tens of millions a year, mostly through our online content. Um, and, uh, and we hope there's 400 million, so we hope to keep cracking away at that. And um, if we can help 100 million entrepreneurs a year, then that right now seem, would seem like a really big goal that we could probably achieve in a few more years. And then we'll get there and then we'll say, okay, how do we get to 200 or 300? And um, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Super, okay. I think on that note, Thank you all for not there. leaving. Um, so I, I'd like to, to thank Derek for his time, Suda. Um, <laughs> uh, there's you know, very few of the speakers that we've had come in here have been truly doing something that's changing the world. And I think you know, what you've shared in terms of the impact that you're having around the globe, but also you know, your own authenticity about that journey so far has been just uh, it's been great. So a round of thank you for very much. Hands. If I get hit by a bus, Star Grind's going to be in great shape because none of this stuff happens without the amazing teams and leaders uh, like David and the people that support them and their families and Pat. Can we give a round of applause for David? Amazing job. You guys and team. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so um, can someone flip the slide? Something this So um, just before I go on to wrap up. We've got another event on this month. Um, we have an amazing founder, Jules Coleman, and um, founded Hassel.com. Um, so we'll